Hey everyone, I'm back. I never resolved the uh, dispute with YouTube, but sod it. I enjoy doing these videos, and I'm going to keep making them. However, I am going to move on to a new project. I was toying with the idea of redoing the Crusader Kings 2 tutorial, and I think I might still do that at some point, but not right now. Crusader Kings 2 has changed a lot, and I've not played it for a few months, and I need to get right back into it. But what I have been playing is Europa Universalis 4. And that is what is going to be presented to you today. Europa Universalis 4 Tutorial, Part 1. This is going to be the longest video, because like with the Crusader Kings 2 tutorials, I want to start by just going over all of the UI and all of the basic concepts to just lay a foundation. I don't expect you to watch this video multiple times and remember everything that I'm saying to you, because that would just be absurd. But connections are going to be starting to get made in the back of your brain. You're going to remember where certain screens are, what certain screens are for, what certain terms mean, and what sections of the game they relate to. And that's basically what this video is. It's the foundation. And from then on, we'll be building up to some of the more specific concepts, and then moving into Let's Play territory. So, sit back, enjoy the ride, and it's good to be back in the driver's seat. Okay, sports fans, let's get started. Okay, for this tutorial game, we're going to play as the Ottomans. It's recommended as a choice for new players, and not without good reason. The Ottomans have a few distinct advantages over other countries at this time. First off, you have uh, bordering relations with the Muslim countries. They tend to have a lower tech level, and so are a lot easier to defeat. Also, you're kind of isolated in the same way that Ireland is in the... Uh, Crusader Kings 2 games. However, with the Ottomans your isolation is more to do with the fact that people generally won't bother you. You'll be involved in a few wars here, but if you're careful and keep these buffer countries happy, you won't ever need to worry too much about attack attacks from Europe, at least not in the early stages. If the Holy Roman Empire gets too strong, or if, the, or if you piss off the papacy, then you're going to be worried. But you can play a political game in the West, and a military game in the East. This also makes them a very good choice for the new player. Other nations are Castile. Castile has some very specific objectives, which are fairly easy to achieve. But at the same time, with Castile, you've got problems with other Catholic nations, and also Muslim nations. And it's a lot harder to play the political game to keep them balanced. Still, it's a little bit more challenging, and but very rewarding for a new player. France I've not really played that much as, but as you can see, you're pretty fragmented. You're going to be attacking and trying to consume a lot of smaller countries, and on the early days as well, you start out in the Hundred Years' War with England. Speaking of which, England is also surprisingly good as an early game for new players. As the game advances, it gets a little bit more difficult to play as England. However, during the early stages, you can basically treat it like you would Ireland in Crusader Kings 2. You have some immediate neighbours that you can conquer with considerable ease, and uh, you can conquer them in a variety of different ways. And thanks to the separation of the channel, and the fact that France is generally at war with itself, and all these other small micronations are at war with each other, you don't really need to worry. You also don't have people of different religions nearby, and that makes relations politically that much easier. But we're going with the Ottomans for the reasons outlined. Start date will simply be Rise of the Ottomans. We're also not going to bother with Iron Man no mode on this, or Random New World either. Okay, so here we are. First of all, let's do the usual spiel. We'll go through the user interface and all of the assorted goodies within it. First of all, up here is where you'll spend most of your game clicking around. This is the notification bar. The notification bar gives you, what else? Notifications. There are three levels of severity. Green, yellow, and red. Red is, this is something that requires your immediate attention. If you do not respond to this, you will likely be in trouble. Yellow is stuff that you really need to be aware of, but you can potentially leave that hovering around. Green is low priority stuff. You don't really need to worry about the green items, but you'd be smart to look at them, because they're usually quickly resolved. So let's have a quick look at what we've got here. Notification that our country is at war? Fine. Revolts possible? This is showing that there are revolts possible in certain territories we own. You can convert provinces to your religion. 
This means that provinces over which I have power can be converted to my state religion. Free advisor slot, we'll cover advisor slots in a moment. Truces will expire. Truces are, much like in Crusader Kings 2, agreements not to attack another country for a certain amount of time. You can violate a truce, but it's generally a very bad idea. We'll see why as we go on. National decisions available, we'll go over it again, we'll cover those in a moment. Disputed succession, we'll cover that one a couple of episodes into the line. And no mission selected, we'll cover again, we'll cover that one probably in this episode. And finally, you can hire a free military leader. We'll cover military leaders probably in two or three episodes' time. So anything that's important will appear here, and if you hover over it, you'll get a far more detailed explanation of what it is that the game is actually trying to tell you. So, next up we have our resources. First off is gold, or ducats, or whatever the hell you want to call it. It's currency. It's moolah. It's simoleons. Money is needed for pretty much everything. Uh, when you buy units, when you buy buildings, you will be spending money. Ensuring that you have an adequate supply of it means that you will probably win the game, if you can balance it with other things. Without it, well, good luck. Manpower. Constructing new armies is a lot easier in Europa Universalis IV than it is in Crusader Kings II. At this point in history, a standing army and professional army was a lot more common, and so consequently equipping and raising troops is much easier. Unfortunately, there are only so many able-bodied men in your country. Manpower is a measure of that. You have a maximum manpower and you gain a certain amount of manpower each month. Whenever you need to replace casualties or construct new units, you lose a certain amount of manpower. If your manpower bottoms out, well, congratulations, you can construct no more units, nor can you reinforce units that exist. Your units will reinforce at the rate that manpower is growing, but if you have a pool that you can dip into, units will reinforce that much faster. Basically, don't go to war unless you've got plenty of warm bodies to throw at the enemy. Next up is stability. Stability ranges from minus three, which the game manual describes as Somalia with muskets. My apologies to any Somali listeners currently, well, listening, or watching as the case may be. And plus three, which is a utopia. The lower your st lower stabilities, so negative stabilities, give you penalties. Increasing your stability gives you bonuses. High stability means better taxation, uh, lower chances of revolts, more legitimacy, things like that. Low stability, the exact opposite, less tax, more chance of rebellion, and so on and so forth. Next up is prestige. Prestige was a measure of score in Crusader Kings 2. Here it's basically a stat. It goes up, it goes down, and the higher it is, the more bonuses you get. You can see here, if you hover over it, the current bonus effects from your prestige. If that goes negative, again, there are problems. So prestige is now not merely a goal in and of itself, but a tool to help you along the way. Finally is your legitimacy. Legitimacy is a measure of how people feel about your ruler and whether or not they are truly the rightful leader of your nation. A low legitimacy means that there's more likely to be revolutions and rebellions, and it also opens up the throne to pretenders and other claimants to try and take your crown. Trying to keep a high legitimacy is pretty important. And likewise, a high legitimacy gives you, as you can see here, additional bonuses. Okay, next along in that same row, we have our specialists. There are four in total. You have merchants who steer trade. We'll cover trade probably in the next episode. You have colonists. Colonists I've not played that much with because I tend to play landlocked powers, but we'll cover those in the appropriate juncture. They're mainly used for settling the New World and distant lands. Then they have diplomats. Diplomats are, well, diplomats. You send them out, they conduct diplomatic missions. They double up as spies doing covert operations, and you also need diplomats free in order to be able to engage in any sort of trade or discussion. This means that it's always important to have at least one diplomat on standby. Say, for example, you have one fabricating a claim and another one improving relations, and those are your only two. If you're at war, you won't be able to try and negotiate a peace treaty because you have no diplomats to send. And finally, you have missionaries. Their position is to allow you to convert provinces of a different religion to your state religion, thus improving stability in that province, increasing taxation, reducing the risk of rebellion, 
and in general making it that much easier to manage. And again, we'll cover specifically how they're used a little bit further down the line. You have here your nation's title, and then here you have your monarch points. These are the core resource of the game. Understanding these monarch points, how they work, how they're generated, how they're spent is key. If you can get your head around that, you've got your head around most of the game. They're split into three types. Administrative power. Administrative power represents your country's ability to use its bureaucracy to fiddle the paperwork, to ensure that laws are correctly applied, and that kind of thing. Administrative power is used to construct administrative buildings, to engage in certain administrative actions, and you'll see as time goes on more and more what it's used for. It mainly is useful for improving things internally within your country, though. Next up, diplomatic power. Diplomatic power is fairly obvious. It is your country's ability to exert your will against other countries without resorting to a pointy stick. Diplomatic power is required in certain diplomatic actions, such as negotiating a peace treaty. It can also be used for a variety of internal struggles, and certain special events may require you to spend or gain diplomatic power. This is true of all monarch points, though. Again, you'll see how it's spent in more detail as we play. And finally, there is military. When you want to recruit military leaders, you spend military power. When you want to storm a stronghold, you use military power. When you want to construct military buildings, you use military power. Basically, if it involves said pointy sticks, it uses military power. You can only save up so much of these points, and your question might be, well, why would I want to save them? Why would I not want them out there doing something useful? Well, there's a variety of reasons. The first and foremost, though, is that these points, as well as giving you all these ancillary benefits, are used to increase your technology levels. So straight away, you can see one of the key decisions in the game is, do I use these monarch points to gain an advantage now, or do I save them later to gain a tech level which will give me a more permanent advantage? And making those decisions is something that we will cover. But beyond that, there's also just an advantage of having a pool of them available. If you end up in a war that you didn't want to be in, well, a large pool of military points can really help turn the tide. Likewise, ensuring that you have diplomacy points available can help you to negotiate a peace treaty. Strangely enough, this means that when you go into war, you want to make sure that you've got plenty of diplomacy points banked up in order to negotiate the treaty, especially if you're trying to seize more with the war than you're really entitled to by your casus belly. So, we've covered the monarch points, we've covered the resources that are available, the specialists, and the notifications. Next up, click the shield. This shield is the symbol of your country, and when you click it, you will access your national menus. Once we've covered this little uh, section, We've covered pretty much everything we need to look at. We'll go over the mini-map and we'll go over the summary screens and a few other little bits, but pretty much all of the game is played in this quadrant of the screen. So, first tab is the government tab. This shows you the type of government that you have and its succession laws. You can also choose to change your government, assuming that you have a suitable tech level or requirements. Some of these this despotic monarchy, for example, you can see here gives you a uh, reduction to national revolt risk and also a reduction to unjustified demands. This basically means that when you're in war, say for example your casus belly, uh, let's just take a look here, go into the political mode. Let's say we're at war with Serbia and we want to take Raska, and that's our casus belly. Say we've seized Kosovo and Zeta and Raska, and we want Kosovo as well as Raska. There is a penalty to requesting Kosovo as part of the peace treaty as well, because the casus belli was to take Raska, so it's an unjustified demand. But if we were to change to a feudal monarchy, instead you'd see we get plus 10% national manpower modifier, and an extra 10% income from vassals. So, there are advantages and disadvantages to different government types, and it costs you a certain amount of administrative power in order to change your government. Next up is your current ruler. Unlike Crusader Kings 2, as I've said before, you're playing a nation, not an individual. This means that dynasties are something that just kind of happen in the background. 
However, your ruler is important. These stats give, tell you how many points they generate in each of the monarch point areas each month. So, this will we basically get six military skill out of this character each month, with an extra five diplomatic skill and five administrative skill. 556 five, is a pretty good ruler. Currently, he however has no legal heir. This basically means that there will be a succession crisis if he dies and our throne could be up for grabs with anyone that we have a royal marriage with. Royal marriages we'll cover in an episode or two's time. You can see our culture here. Culture is divided into groups and then there's like a specific group within it. So for example, primary culture is Turkish and then we have the Turco-Semitic group. So you can see which countries you're more, you can see which cultures you're more accepting of and which other cultures are in your primary group. Different cultures to those that appear on this list, you're going to have penalties dealing with. Uh, so just bear that one in mind and be wary of who your neighbours are. Country modifiers. This is a variety of modifiers currently applied to your country, either through uh, special events or through national decisions. In this case, we have Sheikh ul Islam which gives us plus 1% missionary strength. This means that our missionaries will convert the heathens that little bit faster. Here are our advisor slots. We can click on those to recruit advisors. We'll do that in the next video though. An advisor has a variety of special powers. For example, this one will reduce the national revolt risk. This one improves production efficiency. And this one gives us a bonus to our yearly prestige. Survive these guys, advisors, not survivors, advisors don't last forever. So be careful if you're hiring an old one because you're probably going to need to pay that buy price again much sooner than you'd like. However, the older they are, the more experienced they are and the more useful they can be. You also need to pay them a monthly salary as well, so be careful. Finally, they can give you extra monarch points. So for example, this fellow gives an extra two monarch points per month, whereas these two only give an extra one. And you have one for each of the main roles. And finally, this is a breakdown of how many monarch points we gain per month and from what. So we see we have the base value of three for our administrative power, plus an extra five from our ruler. So if we had, say, a um, administrative power advisor with plus two, we'd end up with an extra ten administrative power each month. And the bar here shows you how much you've got and how much you can keep. But of course, you can also get that by hovering over here, so you'd never need to open this screen just to look at this, unless you were some sort of fool. You're not. I think you're a very intelligent and wise person. After all, you're watching this channel. Next up is the Diplomacy tab. The Diplomacy tab is, what else? Diplomacy. At first, this one looks like a bit of a kludge, especially compared to Crusader Kings 2, but it's actually pretty straightforward. Just click on the nation that you want to have relations with, and you'll see the diplomatic options which are available to you. I should point out here, I'm currently installing a mod that makes this uh, a little bit larger than usual. I would strongly recommend that mod. I will try and find it and give a link to it in the video description. Uh, normally, it only comes down to about there, and it's really annoying when you start opening up a lot of these menus. These menus are all um, collapsible and expandable, so a lot of the options are hidden behind them, but the grouping is reasonably solid and it makes sense. Alliance actions, so you can form coalitions against a nation, you can offer an alliance with them, you can offer to support their independence. They'll obviously really like you if you support their independence, but that means that if they get attacked, well, congratulations, you've just been dragged into a war. We'll go over all of these in a little bit more detail, but for now, all you need to know is where they are, and we'll cover exactly what they do a little bit further down the line. Next up, you have enemies, rivals, and relations. Enemies is basically a nation that they really, really, really don't like and are likely at war with. Rivals are nations of roughly equal power that they are currently competing with. You will also have your own enemies and rivals, and keeping track of who is a rival is important, because rivals are far more likely to cause you trouble than a power of equivalent size nearby. So say for example, um, we might here have the Malmuks as our rival, and uh, the Crimea as well, they're reasonably close by. If the Crimea was our rival and the Malmuks weren't, I'd be a lot more worried about the Crimea attacking me than the Malmuks would. There's big relationship penalties and also an attitude change as well. So, 
continuing to look at diplomacy. That's the other way you can access the diplomacy screen, by the way. Click on the nation and click the diplomacy button there. Uh, you can also see their relations with different powers. So, for example, they have a truce with us. This screen here can start getting really, really, really complicated. Especially as the game goes on and you end up with a labyrinthine mess of alliances and coalitions and all sorts. But remember, just hover over the symbol and that will tell you exactly what the relationship is. And if you don't recognise the flag, hover over it and that will tell you what the actual nation is. Here you will find their, king, their opinion of you and your opinion of them. You can also see their attitude towards you as well. In this case, the Hungarians feel threatened by us. This means that they're more likely to try and join alliances and form coalitions to try and protect themselves. But at the same time, this means that they're more likely to give in to demands from us. And that's one of the things I do like about Europa Universalis. You can basically wield your military as a political tool and threaten people with it without ever needing to actually go to war. So you can click on their shield to go exactly to where they are as well. So say, for example, there is an alliance between, I oh, see here, the Golden Horde is a good example. These are the Carsus Belly that they have. Say we wanted to see who these uh, Nogai were. We couldn't find where they were. You can click on their shield and it'll take you straight to the Nogai. We'll stick with Hungary for now, though. So you can also see their current... Um, administrative points here as well, and diplomacy points and military points, they're monarch points. All easy and good. Finally, there's lists all over here. There's stability, which is their equivalent of that. Remember, attacking a low stability area might help you because there'll be reduced manpower penalties and so on. This shows you their tech levels, administrative, diplomatic and military tech level. It is a very, very stupid idea to try and wage war with someone with a significantly higher tech level than yours. Military tech if they beat you by more than two or three points, you're going to have a bad time unless you bring significant numbers to bear. You can see how many ideas they have, and we'll cover ideas in a moment, and their prestige as well. You can also check their cultural group and how respected their spies and counter spies are. Technology group as well. Well, we'll cover that when we reach the technology tab. So pretty much everything you need to know about a nation not just the diplomatic actions, is all in this screen. If you're considering waging war with them, you can check who their rivals, allies and enemies are. You can check their tech levels. Uh, you can check to see how well they'll hold up against your spies. All there, all useful. The economy screen. Okay, the economy screen is, well, exactly what it says on the tin. It's all your ingoings, all your outgoings, and the various ways that you can manipulate them. So, income gives you an idea of your taxation, production, trade. Trade is very important, and we'll probably have an entire episode dedicated to that. Vassals, if you have them. Tariffs, if you have them. Gold, if you're able to mine it. And war subsidies, which is an option that's available to you if you're at war. You also have your expenses here, listed as your advisors, interest that you have on loans, harbour fees, if you're currently basing fleets out of harbours, Diplomatic expenses, well, you know, diplomats aren't free. You need to host those soirees and so on and so forth. You can set maintenance on a variety of expenditures here. So, for example, say your fleet isn't being used, you can reduce the spending on your fleet. This does have the impact of uh, reducing the morale of your units, as this nice little red flag has shown me. This basically means that if my fleet gets in combat with that level of maintenance, it will immediately break and run. So, yeah, we'll leave that one out for now. You can also take loans, which is actually a lot more useful than it sounds. Taking out loans can mean that you are making money a lot more quickly. You can construct those trade buildings and economic buildings a lot more quickly and pay back that money. Deficit spending is a bit touch and go, but it's still very useful. War taxes. You can use 50 military power to decrease the maintenance of all of your units by raising war taxes. This is extremely useful and sometimes if you're having difficulty getting money together it can be worth going to war with somebody provided you check their allies and so on very carefully first just so that you can raise war taxes and reduce the cost of supporting your military. Inflation. 
Taking out loans causes inflation. Mining gold causes inflation. A variety of random events can cause inflation. Inflation increases the cost of everything that you spend gold on. Buildings and units, for example, become a lot more expensive. Fortunately, you can reduce it by using administrative power, I believe it is, or potentially diplomatic power. I'm pretty sure it's administrative power, but only when it gets above a certain level. Provided that you're not a complete idiot when it comes to managing your money and you're very careful, you should be able to keep your inflation down with relative ease, but we'll cover that when time comes. You can also repay loans at any time, so if you've got the money to repay them, you might as well go ahead and repay them before the interest keeps accumulating or some random event drains your coffers, because, as you know, it always does. And finally up here we have balance. When the total income is tallied, when the total expenses are deducted, here is what we end up with extra each month. Trade. We're going to come back to this one because trade is quite complicated and quite important, so we're going to give that an episode all of its own. Technology. As I've said, technology is used, well, to improve your tech. It improves your performance in a variety of fields. Administrative technology, for example, gives you national ideas. It can unlock new government types. It can improve production efficiency. You can see there at different levels what it does. And also diplomatic technology that can improve your navy. So if you're a naval power, like, for example, England, you may want to put more diplomatic technology in than you would military technology because your navy will probably keep you safer than your armies would. But again, just hover over these and you'll see what uh, sort of things are available and what sort of changes will be made. So, for example, you can see the infantry here. Um, they'll improve their stats at level 7, 8, 14. These cavalry will improve at level 11 and 12. And various things will unlock as well. So, for example, at the next level we'll get uh, an extra 0.5 to our morale for land units. Military tactics plus 0.25. Uh, we'll cover combat again a little bit further down the line, probably in another episode. And a new building, the armory, which will increase manpower, uh, reduce the recruitment time for new regiments, and also reduce the cost of recruiting regiments. So, here we have the technology costs. If you hover over the blocks, it'll show you how much they cost. So, you have 748 administrative power required, but only 104 available. Bah! The base cost of researching this tech level is 600. There's an extra 25% penalty on top of that because I'm Ottoman. A However, when there is a 0.2% decrease in the play. cost because if well, you're ahead of time, well, it's going to cost you more to get that advantage. If you're behind time, the game will take pity on you and reduce the cost. So we'd need to save up 748 administrative power to unlock this. Now, because of the increase over time, if you're really running ahead of yourself, it might be worth just spending those Monarch points on something else. You can see your technology group up here. Being Ottoman means that technology costs more. This is because the Ottomans were not quite as technologically advanced as the rest of Europe, and Europe provides the baseline for the tech level in the game. You can also, however, westernize. This is quite a simple process. But whether or not you do it is a huge decision, because doing this at the wrong time can pretty much cost you a game. So we'll cover that in more detail later. For now, all you need to know is that when you meet the certain criteria, you can westernize. If you westernize, you become part of the Western Technology Group. The Western Technology Group, if we go over here, is the baseline, which means we would lose that 25% increase to the cost of everything. Now, as tempting as losing that might be, well, there's a significant trade-off for it in the time it takes to westernize and the chaos that it causes whilst you are. So, next up, ideas. Ideas are a way that you shape your nation and gain bonuses in the areas relevant to how you want to play. There are a number of national ideas linked with each individual entity within the game. As you advance through the tech trees, you'll unlock these automatically. So, for example, the first one that we unlock is Ottoman Tolerance, which makes it a lot easier to deal with heretics and heathens. This is very important because, as I said, the Ottomans can play a political game in the West, allowing them to keep everyone happy and expand through the East into the other Muslim countries. Next up, we would get Ghazi. That would triple our manpower in religious wars, meaning that, for example, if we had the Casus Belli for a, a Jihad, we would be a quids in. 
Timuriot system, so they go on and they give you various bonuses. Finally, you have national ideas. When you click on these, you get a huge selection of areas to choose from, but they're broken down into three main types, military, diplomatic, and administrative. You can hover over these to see what you would get for them. So if, we were, if for example, we were to adopt aristocratic ideas, we would then need to start spending military points to buy each of these as sort of mini technologies. Uh, so if the first one would be noble knights, once we purchase that, the cost of cavalry would, de would decrease by 20%. Local nobility, that would make uh, the cost of creating cores in our territory a lot more expensive for our enemies. We'll cover cores further down the line, but the core system is similar to the de jour system of Crusader Kings 2. So, which one of these you choose is entirely up to you. For example, say you're playing as Castile and you were looking at uh, focusing a lot on exploration and going through America. You'd want expansion ideas and exploration ideas. And trade ideas is pretty useful for the Ottomans because, well, Constantinople is one of the most important trading hubs in the world, and anything you can do to exploit it is a very good idea. But again, we'll leave those for now, and we'll put them into gameplay further down the line. You also have traditions here, Ottoman traditions, which can give you bonuses and penalties. You'll also have other traditions for different cultures. This basically sets you up and nudges you down certain paths that are more historically accurate. So, for example, as I say with the Ottomans, you're less likely to go to war and try and conquer all of Western Europe, and you're probably advanced east because you can play that political game, and these guys are a lot easier to beat in wars. Religious wars, however, mean that if you are attacked, you'll be able to defend yourself a lot more easily, which in turn, again, means that the European powers are less likely to attack you again contributing to the idea that the Ottomans didn't keep pushing west. However, if you check something like Britain, or specifically England, for example, you would instead get a set of ideas that would nudge you down the path of becoming a maritime empire and huge trading power as well. Missions and decisions. These work similar to ambitions in Crusader Kings 2. So, these are your missions. There are a variety that are available to you at any one time. Some of them will only be available for certain criteria, others are a little bit more general. So for example, achieve religious unity. If you hover over the question mark, it'll show you what you need to do. So in order to achieve this, we need to have a religious unity of at least 100%. We'll discuss religion in a moment. Hover over the envelope, and that will tell you what you get for that. So you gain 10 prestige, 25 administrative power, and 25 diplomatic power. None too shabby. Form an alliance with Dulkardir. So if we can get Dulkardir to ally with us, which is... Where is Dulkardir? There it is. Then we would achieve that objective, and that would get us 10 prestige and 25 diplomatic power. And finally, City of the World's Desire. We should conquer Constantinople, and we'd get 5 prestige from that. So that gives you an idea of the missions that are available to you. They will change over time. Be careful when picking a mission, because whilst you can cancel it, it'll be five years before you're able to pick another mission. That said, if you're very close to being able to complete a mission, odds are the, the mission won't actually appear in the list. So it's sort of an investment. It's going to take you at least three or four years to complete most of the missions that you select. Missions can also give you other bonuses. For example, you might have a mission to uh, conquer this particular part of the world. Selecting that mission would not only give you bonuses to doing so, it would also grant you Castus Belli against those provinces. Well worth remembering. National decisions. These are things that you are capable of doing at this time which affect your entire nation. They're basically almost like passing laws. Any that are not greyed out are gain. So, for example, um, if we selected this one, we would lose 100 military power, but we would gain the, the Dev Shrine system until the 1st of January 1821, which is a very, very long time and is basically the entirety, the entire length of a game. This would increase our national revolt risk, but also increase our national manpower modifier. So very useful if we're planning on fighting a lot of wars. If we can, com if we can combine that with maintaining a high stability to offset the national revolt risk, 
This basically would help ensure that the Ottomans have a plentiful supply of fresh bodies for the meat grinder. Denouncement of sect practices. That would reduce the national revolt risk by one and gain ten piety. And it's pretty much free. So, all it needs is a ruler with a diplomatic skill of at least five who isn't in a regency. So combining these two together means that we basically just lose 100 military power and, well, we would gain 10% on our national manpower modifier. However, the denouncement of sect practices only lasts until the current ruler dies. However, provided that the next ruler has a diplomatic skill of at least five, hey, we can just activate it again. But that's a risk, because if the next one doesn't have a diplomatic skill of at least five, we'd be stuck with that National Revolt Risk modifier. So again, you can hover over any of these question marks to view the criteria. Stability and expansion. This is the good stuff. Well, it's where I like anyway. Stability and expansion allows you to deal with rebels and also help ensure that your country stays cohesive and together. War exhaustion. War exhaustion is basically a measure of how pissed off people are about the fact there's so many more widows around than there used to be. As war exhaustion goes up, you can see there are a variety of effects. You start to lose your manpower, you start to lose morale, it starts to become a lot harder to produce new cores, it becomes a lot harder to defend your fortresses, and basically it just gets worse and worse and worse. So you've got to try and keep your war exhaustion down. The best way to do that is to make sure that you're not constantly fighting wars. You can also reduce it down if it's more than two by spending some military power. Actually, no, it's not military power. I think it's diplomatic power you spend. Stability. You can use administrative power to boost your stability. So you can see how your stability effects will change as well. So if it goes up one, you can see the national revolt modifier goes down. The national tax modifier goes up. The stability cost modifier goes up. This means that it becomes a lot more expensive to boost your stability the higher your stability goes. And the missionary strength goes up. On the other hand, if our stability was to go down, the national revolt risk would go up, interest would start accumulating, and our yearly legitimacy would go down as well. So, overextension. Conquering provinces is all well and good. However, conquering provinces is only part of the battle. You then have to administrate them. You then have to make sure there aren't any rebellions. You then have to make sure that there's no populist uprisings of loyalists. You have to root out sedition. This is modelled by overextension. Overextension is a modifier to a variety of things within the game. As we start gaining overextension, we'll look at it in a little bit more detail. But suffice to say, when you conquer a territory, you have to spend some time making it into what's called a core. If you don't do that, well, all you have is a flimsy administrative presence in the country, which isn't enough to control the populace. And that means that taxation isn't being done properly, uh, recruitment isn't being done properly, rebels abound, and it's probably going to cause you more trouble than it is benefit in the long term. Colonial expansion. This gives you an example of how many um, settlers you have and how far away you can establish your colonies. Again, not played much with the colonists, but we'll cover that if and when we come to it. So, rebels. This will give you an idea as to the current rebels in your country. So we have Bulgarian nationalists who are seeking independence for Bulgaria, who are operating in Tarnovo and Silistra and Burja and Sofia. I believe they're over here. Yeah, there they are. So basically, every month there is a 1.6% chance of a rebel uprising. So we can either let that happen and then just put the rebels down whenever they pop up, or we can try and handle them. Clicking on Handle them will present you with a variety of different ways that you can sort this out. So, what the Bulgarian nationalists want is that Bulgaria will become a free nation. If that happens, we lose 25 prestige and we get a load of other penalties stacked on top of that as well. Basically, this means that rebels no longer just appear and cause you problems. They actually have goals and targets, and if they achieve them, you're in trouble. In short, if they're able to occupy all those territories, they may very well be able to turn around and say, Bulgaria's back. So we can either create cores in these areas. Again, I know I keep using that term, but it's just to put it in context. We'll go over what it actually is a bit further down the line. We can also use harsh treatment. We can spend military power to basically put the boot in. 
and that should suppress the rebellions for a while. Greek patriots defect to Byzantium, so they want to take these areas and defect to the Byzantine Empire. Now oh, that's nicer for them, but uh, we're not going to worry about them for now. I might let one of those two spawn just to show you a little bit of combat. Religion. Religion is different for each different religion within the game, so be careful when you're mucking about with this screen because it might look a little bit different. For the Muslims, you basically have the piety mechanic. Certain, if, certain actions will increase your piety, certain actions will decrease your piety. Waging war against the Muslims will decrease your piety. Waging war against anyone who isn't a Muslim will increase your piety. Likewise, there are certain events and so on that will increase it and decrease it as well. Random events and um, various other things such as certain diplomatic actions. So as piety increases, you gain bonuses. As piety decreases, you end up with penalties. Here you will see a variety of the tolerances that you have. This is basically an example of the modifiers that you have for people of different religion. So for example, tolerance of heathen beliefs, such as the Catholic, Orthodox, the Buddhist, the Hindu, and so forth, we have a minus two penalty with them. Tolerance of heretics, so that's anyone who is Muslim but is not Sunni, um, we have a minus one penalty with. But we have a big, great big bonus to anyone else who is both a Muslim and a Sunni ruler. There's also effects of your religion here as well. So tolerance of the true faith is increased, so we get an extra bonus on top of uh, people who share the same religion compared to the baseline, which I believe in this game is Catholicism. And we also get an extra 100% chance of gaining an heir. Here you can see a list of the different uh, religions within your territory. These are all provinces that I own who are not currently sunny, and we can choose to send missionaries to them. That time will tell you how many months, bear in mind that's months, not days, it will take for the missionary to convert them. So yeah, that national, that achieve religious unity thing, yeah, that's going to take a while. This place alone is going to take 256 months to complete a conversion. And you can see a breakdown there of what the modifiers are and why it's going to take so long. There are ways of boosting that, mainly by increasing stability. Defender of the Faith. This is available to a variety of religions, including Catholicism. If you have 500 gold, you can purchase Defender of the Faith, which gives you all of the bonuses that you see there. An extra missionary, extra morale of armies, extra morale of navies, a decrease to monthly war exhaustion, an increased yearly prestige, but also it costs you a little bit more to purchase technology. That said, if you're planning on waging a lot of war, that is a really, really useful thing to have. Unfortunately, when your ruler dies, the Defender of the Faith title is lost as well, meaning you have to purchase it again. So don't buy it if your ruler is age 60 and probably about to croak. Next up, military. Um, military, you can click on a unit to select different types of units as you unlock them at a variety of tech levels. Always make sure you're using the most up-to-date units possible. You can see their stats here. We'll go over those stats in detail when we talk about warfare. You can see any military leaders that you have here and you can recruit them here. So for example, a general will lead your ground armies, an admiral will lead your navies. You can make a ruler, you can make a general out of your ruler. You can also make a general out of your heir. These have the advantages of being free, but have the problem that you are essentially putting the ruler of your country in harm's way. And when a ruler dies, problems abound. Not huge problems. It's nowhere near as bad as Crusader Kings 2 can get, but it can get pretty gnarly if you're not careful. Oh, and finally, there is the Conquistador. You need the Quest for the New World National Idea, which you'll remember you can pick up from here, in order to build those. But if you construct one, they basically allow you to start heading out and trying to find the new world. Finally, over here, you can see your force limits and current modifiers affecting your army. Army tradition is a uh, measure of, well, how much your country respects and admires your military. As army tradition goes up, people are a lot more proud to serve in the military. They want to serve in the military. Manpower increases, the morale of the army goes up. Army tradition can be gained by winning battles, it can be gained through a variety of random events, and likewise it can be lost through random events and losing battles. Land morale is basically the current morale level of your armed forces. 
Force limit is how many units you can sustain before you start having to pay through the nose for them. We are currently right at our force limit, meaning we can support 27 regiments, and we currently have 27 regiments. Naval tradition and naval morale, exactly the same. Naval tradition gained and lost through uh, research and technology, random events, winning naval battles, and gives you various bonuses to the power of your navy. Uh, the force limit, again, exactly the same. Here we could construct two more ships before we would be at the force limit. Military tactics, as you can see here, military tactics reduces the damage that the units take in combat. The higher it is, the better. Uh, discipline is a measure of exactly how long it's going to take before their troops break. So it's tied in primarily to morale, but it it's kind of how much morale damage your units take when they're attacked, rather than a modifier to morale itself. And finally, there is the defensiveness, which is primarily a political thing more than anything else. High defensiveness basically just means it's pretty difficult for people to start seizing your territory, and it also means that your country is far less likely to succumb to war exhaustion. And that's basically your military screen. You also have, again, obviously, naval units here as well. Finally, subjects. That's greyed out because we have no subjects. Vassals and protectorates are subjects, and you can keep track of them there. And basically, that's everything that you need to play the game. So we're just going to finish up by having a quick look at a few of the other bits of the user interface that the tutorials always do first, but you already know how to do. So if you don't need to be shown how to work the clock and the mini-map, you can turn off now, and may God have mercy on your soul. OK, clock in the corner. Click it to pause and unpause the game. Click the plus and minus button to set the speed. If you're setting the speed higher than 3, you'd better have a bloody good reason for it. Here is the score. You probably don't want to bother keeping track of the score until you've sunk about 20-30 hours into the game and you know exactly what you're doing. Because if you try to chase the score, you're probably just going to overextend yourself and end up falling down flat on your face. This is your current rank in the world. Again, like score, don't worry too much about it. This is your summary screen. You can click this plus button here to set what it is you want to see and what you don't want to see. Uh, for example, the default setting shows pretty much everything. You can see your diplomats, so you can click to see where they're currently assigned. Both of them are currently in the capital. Merchants, you can click to see where they are assigned. You have one assigned in Alexandria and the other one assigned in Constantinople. Armies, you can click there to see where your armies are and shuffle around between them. And same with the navies. You can also name these groups. So we name this one Stubby, because it's only one regiment. This means it's a lot easier to keep track of things. I tend to name my armies things like the Western Watch, the Eastern Watch. So, for example, if I know that the Mamluks are about to where go, some shit's about to go down with them, I know I just need to select all of the Eastern Watch and make sure they're over there. And alternatively, if I really need reinforcements, I summon the Western Watch and get them in on it as well. Finally, there is the minimap. You have the terrain map mode. When you hover over an area, it will give you information about the terrain. This is the percentage chance of a battle being fought in that terrain type. So here in somewhere a lot easier to pronounce, Constantinople, there is a 37% chance a battle will take place on grasslands, a 35% chance it will take place on plains, and a 16% chance it will take place on a coastline. Political map mode. This is the one you'll spend most of your time in. This shows you the basic powers of Europe, and if you end up so, further afield. Trade map mode. This shows you the main trade areas, so for example the Crimea here, Kiev here, Constantinople here. You, you'll spend a fair bit of time in this mode, especially if you're playing as a nation with access to one of the more useful trade nodes. Constantinople is a useless, is a useful trade node. A really useful trade mode. Probably the best in the game. Imperial map mode. This shows you the Holy Roman Empire, its electors, and its um, various subjects and nations. You don't need to worry too much about this one early in the game. If you're playing somewhere in Western Europe, you've got to worry a lot more about the HRE, but generally speaking, they don't bother the Ottomans that much. Generally speaking. Religious map mode. You can see where everyone is on that wonderful, wonderful uh, belief system. 
We have Confucians over there that we have yet to meet. We have Buddhists over here that we know only a little about. There's a load of Sunni over here, loads of Sunnis here. There's some Shiites here. They will be heretics, so we will have an opinion penalty with them, even though they are Muslims. The colour coding is quite nice if they're green, then basically they're Muslim. Different shades of green, different sects, and so potentially heretics. Catholics. Catholics everywhere. Orthodox. Orthodox everywhere. Diplomatic map mode. Click on a country. You can see the nation there. And it's their relations with other people. And finally, under this little button, more map modes, you will find a whole host of various other maps that you will barely ever use. And yet, astonishingly, there'll be that one situation where you absolutely need one of these and you will completely forget that it's in there. So it's worth having a quick look at familiarising yourself with them. I'm not going to go through them. The menu. It's the main menu. You can get it by hitting ESC. Why would you click the button? The ledger. The ledger is... If you can't find it anywhere else, it is in the ledger. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but have a, have a bit of a mess around with it. You'll quickly get the hang of it. History. This is the history of your empire. Any notable wars, any notable successions, anything big will basically be written in there. It's essentially a record of your game to date. Triggered modifiers. This is a list of all of the modifiers in the game that you can trigger and the events that you need to trigger them and the results that you will get for triggering it. So for example, conquest of Rome. Basically, all I need to do is, well, conquer Rome. Hover over that, see, thing is, owns Rome. I get an extra missionary and I also get yearly prestige. This is because I have basically ripped down the capital of the Catholic Empire. East, well, not Catholic Empire, Catholic religion. Conquest of Jerusalem, if I can conquer Judea, gain an extra missionary, gain yearly prestige. Imperial integrity, I can become a part of the HRE, for example. The Ottomans in the Holy Roman Empire, wow, there's a thought. But yes, these will change as the game goes on and you have the scope to try and trigger a few more of these, so it's worth checking them every half hour or so. Find province. Start typing the province, and you will be presented with a list of possibles. Click province to get taken straight there. This is the Holy Roman Empire. You don't need to worry about this screen for now. Again, you don't need to worry about the HRE if you're in Europe. Also down here, if you're playing a Catholic power, is the principles behind electing cardinals to the papacy. And the person who has the most cardinals is able to influence the Pope. But again, we're not playing with that now. That's another reason why the Ottomans are so good. You don't really need to worry about those sorts of mechanics, and you can concentrate on learning the core of the game. This is a war score. Those of you who have played Crusader Kings 2 will know this one. We'll cover that in detail later. So, that's it. That is the basic foundation level tutorial showing you the user interface and everything within it. I do not expect you to remember all this. Believe me, this is just so that you can start to create associations with certain terms and certain menus and to give you an idea of, say for example, uh, I want to start a war, what do I need to do? Well, you know that you probably want to start checking this military tab over here. Um, oh yeah, they're in diplomacy, you can see who their allies and things are as well to make sure that you're not biting off more than you can chew. That's the goal. I don't want you to remember everything. I just want you to remember that there are certain things out there that can help and how you can reach them. So. Next week, we'll go into detail looking at trade, and um, then we'll start looking at warfare, and then we'll move into Let's Play territory, and we'll put all these principles into practice. For now, I'm Evis T, signing off.